Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from Investor Stream, and I'll be your host today. Pre presenting for us this morning is Pan Continental Energy Limited Executive Chairman Ernie Myers and Board Advisor Ian Smith to provide investors with an update on the company's recent progress and forward operations. Please feel free to send in your questions via the chat platform in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you could also email them to me at alex at investorstream.com.au. We've had a couple of questions already emailed through and uh, really appreciate you sending those through, so keep them coming. You can also download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. A copy of the webinar will also be available on Pan Continental's website and social media platforms later today, uh, but for now I'd like to throw it over to Ernie to kick things off for us. Ernie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alex. Um, look, the last um, 12 months have been transformational for uh, PCL. We uh, received the um, ministerial approval for a 12-month extension of the Pell A7 block, and uh, that gave us the breathing space we needed to execute an option agreement with Woodside, whereby they would carry out a seismic program of some, well, it turned out to be finally 6,600 square kilometres of 3D, at a cost of over 35 million US dollars. And whilst uh, that's going on, we've also seen continued exploration in the Orange Basin offshore Namibia. We've got the super majors, uh, Total, Shell, Chevron, and now we've seen Gulp come in. Uh, we've seen uh, an extraordinary success rate with the wells that have been drilled there, and this has enhanced PanCon's position in the basin. Uh, we also took the opportunity in this last year of uh, strengthening our balance sheet by a $5 million placement. So we're well placed now as we go into 2024, which is going to be truly an, an exciting year for uh, PanCon. So now I'll hand over to Ian, who will run us through some of the um, important things on our, uh, our exploration endeavours there. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. Uh, we had the company's AGM uh, yesterday afternoon, so obviously not everybody is able to attend that meeting, it being held here in Perth. So uh, basically we'd like to run through the presentation which we delivered yesterday, and there will be an opportunity for Q&A um, at the end. So this is really just to give you a bit of a picture as to where we're at and, and, and where, we're, where we're heading with the uh, Namibian project. So why are we so excited? Why is Namibia such a rich hunting ground for oil and gas? Uh, I think it's fair to say that right now, um, certainly over the last 12 to 18 months, the Namibian Orange Basin specifically is probably the global exploration hotspot for oil uh, and uh, predominantly oil, but also gas. Um, this is a result of some very major discoveries being made on trend to the south of us by Shell and Total Energy. Um, and we'll get on to a bit of detail about those. To me, there's real kind of one big reason why this is a great place to go looking is all about the the West Coast Africa, East Coast South America, um, Atlantic margin spreading, contiguous geology, um, comparable geology on both sides of the margin, uh, a deposition of a very significant source rock when the margin initially opened, the presence of turbiditic reservoir systems on both sides of the margin, um, which I think is very important and we'll, we'll get to. Um, it just sets up sets up the fantastic play that we're, we're seeing develop and um, provides scope for accumulations, very large accumulations of, of oil and gas. Um, from a, from a non-technical point of view, we find Namibia is a great place to be working. Pancon's been in there for working in Namibia for many years. Uh, we have excellent relations with the Ministry of Mines and Energy, find them very good to work with. And obviously the, you know, the company's uh, politically very stable and has very favorable fiscal terms. So a little bit on the, the very sort of high regional geology. Um, down both sides of the Atlantic margin, we see a series of very prolific oil and gas basins. Um, these predominantly host these turbidite systems. They do have the comparable source rock. Uh, and this is because basically the, the, the geology was, is, is pretty much identical. Uh, while we have different formation names across this margin, these two continents were once, uh, were once one. And uh, that's why we see very sort of analogous geology either side of the margins. Um, when the seafloor spreading initially uh, occurred with the Atlantic margin opening up, we saw the, uh, the deposition of the Kudu Shale oil source rock over an extensive portion of this area. And I think that's probably one of the most important aspects of the play 
that we're chasing. So Pancon's PAL87 permit was awarded by uh, to a joint venture led by Pancon as operator. We applied for the permit in 2018. We have a 75% working interest. It's an 11,000 square kilometer permit down in the Orange Basin. We regard this area here highlighted as probably the most prospective zone. Uh, as you move north of this area, you get into the Luderitz and then the Walvis Basins, which have not seen the degree of exploration success that we're seeing in the Orange Basin. The Orange Basin opens up to the south into South African waters, and I think we can probably expect to see uh, a lot of exploration success um, within South African waters uh, to, to come. So why are we excited? I think the discoveries that are being made to the south are a particular play, particular age rocks, and we're chasing the very same age rocks and type of rocks in our permit. We've only had one well drilled in the permit to date, some 10 years ago, uh, which is an important well. It was the dry hole, but there are very good reasons for that, and we'll come to that. Uh, and as Ernie mentioned, we've had Woodside come in this year uh, and make a huge investment, spending over 35 million US on a very large 3D seismic survey, which is being processed right now, and you know, the results of which will inform which size decision going forward, and uh, we, we hope that that will generate a very substantial prospect and lead infantry to, to move the project forward throughout next year. Uh, I would mention that the, with uh, Woodside's uh, cooperation, the JV has recently applied to the Ministry to enter into the next expiration period, which is a two-year period commencing 24th of January. Uh, that period will carry a work commitment of a single exploration well, or alternatively, in the unlikely event that a drillable prospect cannot be identified, then there's a, a relatively small seismic uh, commitment uh, required. Uh, in either case, um, would, um, Pancom bears no financial liability with regards to any uh, non-performance of, of those work commi commitments under the under the option deed that we have with Woodside Energy. So the Woodside deal. Um, Woodside has essentially earned already uh, an option to acquire a 56% participating interest in the permit. Uh, they've done that by funding this, this uh, 3D seismic survey. Um, the data is being processed. Woodside will now have a decision to make in the future uh, as to whether they want to proceed by uh, earning that interest, going on title on the permit, in which case they will be required to fully carry the existing joint venture through the drilling of an exploration well, which could is estimated to potentially cost between 45 and 60 million US dollars. Uh, in the event that Woodside do exercise, then Pancom will drop down to a 20% fully carried interest. So that's very material given the, the scope and the scale of the uh, some of the targets that we're, we're, hoping, we're hoping to see. Uh, after the first well, um, if the JV elects to drill a second well, um, which could could be you know come successful or failure, um, there still may be appetite to, to drill a second well. Uh, Pancom has the ability to either retain a 20% interest and fund our share of net share of drilling costs. Uh, alternatively, this is an important one. We will we'll have the ability to uh, ask Woodside to basically give us a fully carry for a second time. Uh, by dropping down to a 10% participating interest. Um, so that gives us some important sort of optionality, uh, very important for a, a small junior like Pancom to have these kind of these options built in. Okay, zoom in on the Namibian Orange Basin. Okay, we're in, uh, we're in deep water from 200 meters up on the continental shelf all the way down to 4,000 meters. Um, this basin was developed throughout the Jurassic to Cretaceous period. And to me, there are two main contributing factors to the fantastic prospectivity we're seeing. First is what I've mentioned is uh, the presence of a thick, very high quality, uh, area extensive source rock called the Kudu oil shale. And secondly is the reservoir system, the, the, the vast sediment input which has come in from the, from the east, northeast, from the continental shelf, the sands that are being deposited into the deep water uh, in, into a deep water environment where you, you wouldn't norm, ordinarily expect to find sands. Sands are normally deposited up on the shelf margin uh, in, in deltaic systems and beach systems. Um, there's a specific mechanism required to get sands down into this deep water environment. 
and uh, we'll, we'll get onto that in, in a moment. So the, the the discoveries of 2022 through to this year by Total Energy and Shell have, have created a huge amount of industry interest. There's four rigs currently active in these two permits to the south, Total Energy and Shell, and Galp Energia, the Portuguese company, has just in the last few days spudded a well called Mapani 1X. Um, in this area somewhere, we don't know the precise location just yet, it's in this, this area down here, targeting the same geological play that we're all, we're all pursuing. Um, this is the first of two wells for Galp, and they've stated that they're targeting a, a mean in-place resource of 10 billion barrels. We're not sure if that's the first well or the two wells combined, but they clearly see very large potential. They've clearly had the ability to farm out um, from their 80% current interest. They've elected not to do so, so that suggests they're um, you know, they're extremely bullish by what they're seeing. Also, we expect to see Chevron commence drilling uh, next calendar year. They've completed 3D seismic surveys this year. They've recently submitted an application, uh, environmental application, to drill up to five exploration wells and five appraisal wells. So we don't know their, their exact plans, but um, yeah, there's going to be an awful lot more activity coming over the next um, 12 to 18 months. And you can see here some of these discoveries that you know, we have Venus that's uh, reported to have three billion barrels of recoverable oil. We have the Shell discoveries which have two and 2.5 billion barrels in place. We don't have recoverable numbers for that. And there's also a legacy gas field called Kudu which uh, has been sat there for a while awaiting development. Um, that's reported to have 1.3 TCF recoverable with potential for up, up to I think 3 TCF. There's a lot of associated gas with these Shell and Total Energy discoveries and we know that the Ministry is kind of leaning on the operators to do something with that gas that, that you know, kind of in tandem with, with the Kudu field here could potentially see that being, uh, being developed also. So what caused all the excited excitement in this part of the world? That, that it was a Venus oil discovery of March 2022. Um, up till that time, I think uh, it would be fair to say you know, drilling success had been very limited. There was some enticing, there was some, some oil shows, hints of a working petroleum system, but Total came in and drilled Venus 1X and totally knocked it out of the park. And they've subsequently appraised this, this huge structure, um, which is a, a, a basin floor sand. It's a turbidite related feature. And we believe it's reported to have an est estimated 3 billion barrels of oil recoverable. Um, both of those wells have been now been production tested. We don't have flow rates, so those haven't been reported by the operator. But industry media has reported on the fact that you know, Total is saying they're very pleased with what they have and deliverability appears to be quite excellent. So it seems we're looking at very good quality reservoirs and very, very light oil. Shell, meanwhile, have been busy in their permit and they've, uh, they've drilled five wells thus far, four of which are discoveries. Uh, so they've made discoveries at, at Graf, at, at Jonka, Lesedi, and Lerona. They're currently drilling a, a Yonka 1 appraisal well. Total Energy is drilling the Mangeti 1 X, uh, exploration prospect just to the north of Venus, which we understand is stratigraphically higher, uh, but will also drill down below to the Venus level to potentially appraise the northern extent of, uh, of Venus. Um, there have been large amounts of gas reported with these two with these collective discoveries by the ministry uh, some up to 8.7 tcf recoverable of so we think it's recoverable of associated gas and that's very interesting we don't know if that is a is that gas that's coming out of dissolution from the oil as the oil is produced uh, associated gas or is it is there is there a gas cap um, these big companies don't give us the detail and it'll be some time before that kind of information becomes Public, but clearly, these two permits uh, are very material for these two two major companies. Total Energy refers to to their permit as the golden block, and they've allocated half of their global exploration appraisal drilling budget to that single block for this current financial year. Uh, and Shell's investing a quarter of its global deep water exploration drilling budget in, in this single permit. So, and they have. Uh, I think another seven or eight wells permitted. Um, I think it's fair to say these rigs are going to be kept busy for, um, for quite some time. Um, there have been two uh, disappointments in recent months. I think we, we should we should we should talk about those. 
The first one was Shell's Cullinan 1 well, located here. Um, that was an interesting one, and not dissimilar to the Moosehead 1 well, which was drilled in our permit. Um, what's important to understand here is that it was chasing a completely different geological play. It was chasing a deeper play, uh, a Beremian carbonate play. So not chasing late Cretaceous sandstones. Um, at Moosehead 1, which we'll get to later, drilled 10 years ago, it drilled that play I think it was drilled because the structure was just too big to ignore. It was probably recognized as very high risk, and indeed turned out that the carbonates um, did not exhibit um, any, any good porosity. And lo and behold, um, the same thing has happened for Shell. They've, they've drilled these aged carbonates, and, and um, the reservoir is tight. I suspect, as with Moosehead, this feature was probably just too large to ignore. And if you're Shell and you've got a rig that's running hot, and uh, you know, it's looking for locations to drill. Um, they can afford to uh, to take these risks. Um, so we don't see that as in any way degrading um, the prospectivity of the Lake Cretaceous um, sandstone play, and certainly not in any way affecting the prospectivity of Pell 87 and, and the Saturn feature. Perhaps slightly more relevant is uh, Total's Nara 1X well located here. You can see that that was located quite some distance, um, probably 40 k's to the west of uh, the Venus discovery, and again was a dry hole. It did look quite good on seismic. It looked quite similar to Venus. Um, we don't know why it's dry. However, it's fair to say that you probably have a, a fairway uh, that, um, that runs through this the heart of this basin that perhaps looks something something like that, where you can expect to find these good quality um, reservoirs. Because as you come inboard towards the continent, you're on the shelf. The turbidites would not have been deposited. And as you as you come too far uh, too far to the west, um, you're going to get to to a location where you're too far outboard for deposition of sandstones. And I'm sorry, I've driven. I've drawn that terribly because I've actually um, actually gone. Here we go. We'll try it. We'll try it again. Um, you're probably looking something. Beg your pardon. Ain't technology great. Highlighter. You yeah, were probably looking something like this. It's a fair way. Sorry, it's a bit difficult to control. I've done it again. But anyway, you get, you get the point. As, as you get too far to the west, um, the sands will the, the system the system energy the turbulent system energy it drops as you lose gradient on the slope. The first thing to be deposited is your sandstones, and your silts and mudstones make it that much further. So it's quite likely, and it's to be expected that as you get to the uh, to the west, the reservoir quality is going to degrade. And we can only speculate at this time, but one one potential contributing factor to this being a dry hole is it, it is perhaps reservoir poor reservoir quality. Okay, turbidites. Um, I find this fascinating. Uh, it's really important. I think one thing to appreciate here is that while we are um, exploring a deep water environment, deep water today, um, we're exploring for rocks that were deposited in deep water. So that we've had you know, this deep water system has prevailed for, for many millions of years, all the way through the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Now, typically, sandstones do not get deposited in deep water. Deep water is a great place to go looking for source rocks. Uh, the silts, the mudstones, the, the, the organic material, uh, it, it can travel hundreds of kilometers into the deep water and be, be deposited. Sandstones tend to be deposited nearer the, nearer the surface. So how do, we, how do we get good quality sandstones right down into the deep water where our source rock is? And this is just the kind of system that we see all the way down the west coast of Africa and east coast Brazil. It's a very important one to, to understand. It, it's turbidite. It's a turbidite system that, that achieves this. And if you imagine this being the continental shelf, relatively shallow water, relatively flat, um, sandstones can make it this far. You know, you kind of uh, you have deltas set up uh, on, on the coast, and they feed into channel systems which will deposit sandstones on the continental shelf edge. These uh, these sands will accumulate, and at discrete points of time, they will be triggered by typically by seismic tectonic events generating what we call a submarine density flow, which is quite a self-sustaining um, flow, which can travel hundreds of kilometers down the, the, the continental slope 
all the way down into the, the sort of the, the, the very deep water into the submarine uh, submarine plane. Um, it's a very self-sustaining mechanism. It's a bit like an, essentially a submarine, an underwater landslide, for want of a better word. But it, it, it's driven by the, the different indensity uh, between the, the, the ocean, essentially, and the flow mass itself, and that gives the system the energy to travel so far. And, and, and these systems can even scour out channels, uh, essentially submarine gorges. They travel down gorges, and as you as you come down the slope, you will see creation of meandering channels, just like you see meandering rivers in the onshore. Uh, you will see deposition of sandstones within those channels. You will see deposition of silts and mudstones in the overbank deposits. As you come into the, the real deep water, the, the system slows down, loses energy, the sands are finally deposited, uh, the, the, final, the lighter sands perhaps in, in these submarine fans before you get into the, uh, excuse me, before you get into the um, the real distal component, way beyond these tablet systems, you can only really expect to receive you know, mudstones and siltstones. So perhaps Nara 1X might be situated somewhere, somewhere like this location. Uh, excuse me, change that. This location here, right on the fringes of a basin flat fan, where you know it, the, the 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 deposition is predominantly silts and mudstones. It's it's a pretty dirty, dirty sandstone system. So these, these systems uh, are, are quite discrete. They can be huge. They can cover massive areas. They can travel vast distances. They show up on seismic exceedingly well. Um, and, and our feature, our turbolite related feature is called Saturn. It's very evident on the 2D seismic and obviously even more so on the 3D seismic. And these form, we think, you know, certainly without doubt, the most prolific reservoir system offshore West Africa, all the way from Ghana down through now to southern Namibia. Complex internally, you can see here, someone's likened this to me the other day, to a bag of snakes. You've got overlapping channels, meandering channels, um, mounds, turbidite lobes leading to these fans. Um, you need to really work your seismic data to, to, to figure out where the best place to drill is. 2D seismic data won't cut it. Um, 3D seismic is essential. Uh, and even then, this is, this is not just... Um, using the seismic to create horizon maps and maps, map bumps. We've got to get every, every bit of information from that seismic data that we can to high grade uh, leads and, and prospects for drilling. Um, and quantitative interpretation, seismic attribute analysis, direct hydrocarbon indicators are, are, are key, um, are key in, this, in this area. And here's a couple of examples from Namibia of uh, the seismic expression of turbidite systems. These are actually from the Walvis Basin up, up in the north, but they show very nicely you know, what we're looking for. Um, here we're looking at, you can, if you imagine this is a, a slice through a 3D seismic volume, and we're looking down at, at a perspective at the top of that slice, you can see in the left-hand example, we've got these meandering channels. They, they show up just so beautifully. And, and they light up, they, they exhibit, th these, in this particular case, they exhibit a high seismic amplitude. Uh, the reason for that can be one of two things or both. Uh, it can be the presence of good reservoir quality sands, hence porosity. That porosity can create an amplitude response which you see, it lights up. And it can also be due to the presence of hydrocarbons. So if you have uh, the presence of hydrocarbons and good reservoir, you can expect uh, a pretty nice seismic anomaly, which we would regard as a direct hydrocarbon indicator. So this is a interest slope setting, probably similar to what we're expecting to see at uh, Pad 87 in Saturn. Um, the I think it's fair to say that the shell discoveries are probably within this kind of setting. Uh, Total Energy's Venus is is further outboard. This example from the Walvis Basin shows up beautifully these basin floor fans which are illuminated they again they due to good porosity they exhibit uh, these these high responses you can even see these channel systems going up onto the continental shelf these are the feeder channels to the basin fan. so um, fascinating stuff geologically um, great place to be exploring the fact that you've you know, the, these features we know have been deposited directly on top of the source rock it's really quite a simple geological play. While there's some complexity within the turbidite system itself, the play itself is really quite simple, and we'll get to that.
a little bit on the kudu shale. Uh, this is an analysis from the single well in our permit, Moosehead 1X. Um, it's pervasive over the, over the whole of, 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 the, of the area. Um, was deposited at a time when the Atlantic margin had, was just starting to open, yet um, this, the oceanic system was, was quite close, so limited marine influence. Um, think of it as a, a large sort of lacustrine or lake system um, with a low oxygen environment, anoxic conditions, and that's ideal for source rock deposition. And we know that in, in, in the Moosehead, we had almost 200 meters of, of very good quality, uh, up to 5% total organic content formation. And um, it's been drilled in elsewhere in the basin and has exhibited to total TOC of up to 14%. So exceedingly rich uh, source rock. And there's no doubt that it's proving to be a prolific source rock in, in, in the area that we're exploring. Okay, so more a bit, bit more detail on, on our permit, our prospectivity. Saturn, the Saturn Turbidite complex is what's got us excited. This line here is an east-west line running across Saturn. It's the most recent data that we have that we received some weeks ago. It's a, a fast-track 3D pre-stat depth migration. So the scale here is, is a depth. And um, you can see here this, this feature we call Saturn. It, it, this is the interest slope sort of depositional package, um, which was so clear on 2D data and is, is backed up by the 3D even more. Um, we know we've mapped this to cover an area, the core area of over 2,400 square kilometers. Now, we're not saying that this whole package is a single prospect. If it were, the, the, the numbers, the prospective resources would be off the scale. What we're saying is this is a really rich, target-rich area to be uh, looking for leads and prospects with the 3D seismic that we have. And um, given the area of the feature and, and the thickness, you know, we, we, we feel very confident that there's going to be something that is worthy of, of, of drilling. Important to note that, that these rocks were deposited at the very same time as the, uh, the Venus Reservoir. Uh, we're sharing the same source. Um, the um, the shell discoveries are up in the Cenomanian, so they're a little bit a little bit higher, and you know that's something that we'll be also uh, investigating from the 3D to see if there's any potential uh, over and above what we see in Saturn. Uh, I touched on the simplicity of the play. Well, he, here is your Kudu oil shell directly beneath Saturn. We know we've got a very thick shale ceiling over top of Saturn. And we know that Saturn is very likely to host relatively high net to gross sand versus siltstone. So if you have a mature oil shale beneath Saturn, you've got a very limited migration path. It's directly up. Uh, your seal is very competent. It's been proven. Um, it's all about finding a, a nice feature in here, perhaps a channel, uh, perhaps it exhibits a DHI or a channel or two uh, that um, the, the, the warrant drilling, uh, and the play is really quite simple. Importantly, we have counter-regional dip. So the regional dip here is dipping from the east down to the west. But you see here, we've actually got dip up to the west. That's important um, because we're looking probably not at pure structural plays. We may be looking at pure stratigraphic plays, but more likely uh, we're going to be looking at combination traps where you might have a stratigraphic feature that has a structural component. And we know that that's the case at Venus. We know that Venus exhibits, um, it has this basin floor fan deposit that actually dips, has this counter-regional dip. And that counter-regional dip up to the west uh, actually sets up the trap for Venus. So we're very encouraged by that. Uh, that bodes, bodes well. Um, and other features that we might be looking for, for example, are if you have a channel system that is, is draped over a, an underlying structure, what they typically call in the industry a hose over a nose, that can be a great place to go to go looking for a, for a hydrocarbon filled reservoir. So very simple, really, from a, a play point of view, it's all about identifying leads and prospects within this broader area. We expect the target depth for any exploration well to be in the range of 3,500 to 4,000 meters. And as I mentioned, it's all about using, really working the 3D seismic data to get a lot more out rather than just mapping these horizons. We've got to tease out all the information we can from the seismic data to give us an indication of the, the nature of the, the rocks and probably more importantly, the, the potential reservoir fluids therein. Okay, this is 
another line of the, the same vintage data set. This runs north-south, uh, again through Saturn, intersecting the Moosehead 1x well to the south, which we, we mentioned. Uh, this is important because this well was drilled 10 years ago by a Brazilian company, HRT. I mentioned it was um, targeting a very different play with carbonate structure of Bereamian age. The targeting featured down here, and you can see it was a huge, huge structural closure which probably went off to the south also. Um, would have been very high risk, but I think too big to ignore and, you know, and good for them for trying. Um, importantly though, you know, we've got kind of a, a, th a three ride in the sense because that this well has encountered uh, the top seal for us. It's encountered Saturn age rocks, but in a very distal location. So we wouldn't expect, what we see here is mudstones and siltstones. We expect this to be beyond beyond the main core area of Saturn. So we wouldn't expect to see good quality sandstones in, in there. Probably when you get into, into here is when you might see those good quality sandstones appearing. And certainly as you get into the, into the heart of the complex. Um, and, and we know that this well has intersected a very thick and competent uh, sh ceiling shale. So it's, it's ticked a number of boxes for the play within our, within our permit. The, Kudu shale at this well was actually interpreted from an analysis to be not fully mature for oil generation. It was just early onset maturity at, at this depth. And what gives us good confidence that we're going to have a, a, an oil shale that's clearly in the window generate, you know, in, in, in the, the oil generation window beneath Saturn is that based on the, the PSDM data, we're seeing the, the recent data. We're probably some four to 500 meters deeper uh, beneath Saturn. That clearly, we think, puts us in a, you know, right, in the, right in the middle of, uh, we should have a, a generating oil system even, even through to this day. So that, that bodes very well for source maturity directly beneath our, uh, our main prospective package. Okay, a little bit about the survey. Um, fully funded by Woodside. We executed the adoption deed with Woodside in March. I think the survey commenced within a week or two, took maybe two months to complete. It was originally budgeted to be 5,000 square kilometers at a, at a cost of 35 million US. While we were acquiring the survey, Woodside elected to increase it to nearly 6,600 square kilometers. And, and what was pleasing is that at no point did they come to us to seek to recut the deal or ask for any contribution from Pancon. They just, they just did it. Um, the survey was completed late May. We have received three fast track data sets thus far. The data is of very good quality. Um, we expect to receive the final depth migration data set within the coming weeks, uh, either very late December or, or, or sort of by mid January. Uh, each time we've had a received a fast track data set, there's only so much we can do. We can interpret up to a point, and there comes a point where you. you Given what we're trying to get out from the data, which is not just mapping bumps, but 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 extract extract the maximum information from the data, we really need that final pre-stat depth migration and the associated seismic products, such as particularly angle stack gathers, uh, in order to get on with the the real detailed um, attribute analysis, which will include AVO analysis and a range of other attribute analysis, which you know um, Woodside will will be throwing everything at. No, no doubt they'll have a large team looking at this. And the aim of that is really to identify potential direct hydrocarbon indicators. Plenty of discoveries have been made without seismic anomalies around the world. Um, but uh, the big companies, you know, they, they do like to see DHIs, and I'm sure that Woodside would be uh, expecting, would we'll be hoping to see one. And um, at the very least, that will help with prospect ranking and a decision over which prospect to drill. If you've got two prospects that look the same, one's got a DHI, it's, it's very clear as to which one you would go for. And um, leave you with this slide, which is, is really just to get a point this, across the, the scale of Saturn. As we're saying, it's, it's not a single large prospect, but it's a really rich area to be looking for leads and prospects. We haven't put any detail out thus far from what we've seen on the fast track. Um, the data is preliminary. Uh, Woodside in particular have asked that we kind of um, basically take our time and, and not make any disclosure until we've received the final data, a very thorough analysis. Uh, and at that point, I think, and, we, and also we need to have 
al alignment within the joint venture. Um, but we would hope to be in a position, certainly throughout Q1 and Q2, to put out a lot more detail, le leading eventually, obviously, to a, um, a prospect and lead inventory with associated prospective resources, probably independently certified. But that is going to take some time. There's a lot of work to be done when we receive that final data. But I think it's fair to say there's a lot of news that's going to be coming for the first half of next year, hopefully leading to a decision by Woodside to to go forward and, and drill an exploration well for the, for the joint venture. Um, and I guess really the point of this slide is, you know, look, look, at, look at the area of Venus, for example, 600 square kilometers, it's huge, uh, 3 billion barrels. Saturn has room, we could fit a Venus in there. Uh, and, um, you know, we're certainly, we're chasing, we're chasing big targets, I think is, is, is the point to take away from, from, uh, from this slide. And that pretty much concludes the presentation. Thank you. Um, I think we can move on to Q&A. Uh, uh, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Anne. Thanks, Ernie. Look, we have had a few questions come through, and uh, I would ask anyone um, listening who would like to submit some more questions, please do so. Um, when does the 180 days clock start for Woodside? Uh, sorry, when does the 180 days clock start for Woodside to make that decision whether or not to exercise their option to become an operator in our permit? Um, and when does the option expire? And what are the thoughts on the new data? Okay, the option um, is 60, six months from the date that the final um, data is received. We're anticipating that could be the, the end of December, early January. So that's when the six months will um, the trigger point will come, uh, at, and then um, as to uh, the next step, if uh, Woodside elect not to exercise the option, um, we would enter into the additional um, first additional period, and we would be indemnified by Woodside for the costs of that. And in terms of our thoughts on the, 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 the data, I think we need to be very careful what we say because um, the data is preliminary. But I think it's fair to say we're, we have, we're, we're encouraged, we're certainly encouraged. You know, we, we, we still see uh, the, the 3D backs up the story um, based on, you know, we went in with a, an understanding of the 2D and a, and a, and a, and a, a kind of a hypothesis. And I think the, 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 the 3D data backs it up. I think that's all we can say at, at this time. So if Woodside do take up their option, will PCL have any say in which prospect gets drilled first or will that decision lie solely with Woodside? I think it's, while we, we have a very collaborative arrangement at the moment, ultimately it's going to be Woodside's money. It's a lot of money. I think it's fair to uh, say that Woodside would expect to have that, uh, have that choice. It'll be a Woodside elected uh, prospect, hopefully one that we fully agree with. Thanks, Anne. So what is the biggest hurdle you see to overcome between now and a potential drill, assuming Woodside opt to, uh, opt to farm in? Um, are, you, are there any potential issues with securing drill ships, et cetera? No, I mean, we, we know that Woodside's drilling guys are already kind of looking at, at rig availability for, you know, probably, probably late next calendar year. Um, can't go into too much detail, but, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're seeing. We see, we see options. We've, we're four rigs in the basin now. Potentially a fifth rig being brought in by Chevron next year. Um, there are rigs in the area. Thanks, Ed. Now you, you mentioned uh, the, the possibilities if Woodside doesn't um, exercise the option. So if we could play devil's advocate for for a moment, if Woodside don't take up the option, um, do you have a plan B? Are there any other suitors interested in the farm out? Uh, we're not engaged, obviously. Woodside has an exclusive option right now, being appropriate for, for us to talk to anybody. Um, I would say, and you never, you never know. I mean, companies decide to invest and not invest in things for, for various reasons that, that may not be technical. But we, we feel confident the chances of Woodside exercising. But until they do, um, it's not in the bag. If they don't, um, we should know by mid next year. We'll still have 18 months on the permit um, and uh, sufficient time I think to take it out to the broader market and I think you, we would get a we would get a huge amount of interest um, in, in terms of opening up a data room I'm, I'm sure you know we'd have a lot of big companies wanting to take a look. It's probably worth yeah. mentioning that we are because of this unique uh, option arrangement Pan Continental is the operator 
And as such, uh, we have um, the data. Obviously, Woodside have uh, copies of the data as well. So it's not as if they walk away and take any of the data. We, we would have the data with us. Thanks, Ernie. So in the early stage 3D seismics results that you've received recently, does this meet or exceed your expectations based on legacy 2D seismics? Uh, I think it's fair to say it meets. You know, we, we, uh, I don't think it would be appropriate at this stage to say it exceeds just because it's preliminary data and that's a fairly bold statement to make. Um, it certainly meets our expectations. You know, we, we remain very optimistic about the prospectivity. So obviously we taking, uh, I guess, the, the opinion that uh, Woodside farming in is a given. What is management's, uh, and to your knowledge, Woodside's view on the satin structure resource-wise, now that we understand it hosts various prospects and leads, as well as the counter-regional dip? Yeah, look again, uh, not an appropriate time to comment on that. We haven't even run any numbers. Um, and um, we'll get to that point as we probably into Q2 of next year when, when we have a, uh, an inventory. It's important we have alignment, particularly with Woodside, but across the broader JV as to what we see. Uh, and that will be a collaborative process. Uh, I think only once we've really identified leads and, and prospects and, and, and ranked them and agreed should we really start to put that, 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 that detail out. We appreciate everyone is, is hanging out to know, but um, um, and there are prospective resources back from, I think, 2019 based on the 2D. Yeah, I, I, I think it's fair to say that we yeah, that there are numbers there which we, we certainly hope to exceed in terms of potential pr prospective resources. So in terms of a timeline, when do you expect to see the first well possibly drilled? I think if we assume that a wood does, Woodside decision by sort of late June, then you're really probably looking for another six months from there. So potentially at the back end of next calendar year or early, uh, early 25. And Ed, could you just elaborate on why was the 3D area increased? Uh, simply because um, when you're running 3D seismic, um, it's a very efficient process. The, the vessel that we had ran, I think, 12 streamers each of which is 10 kilometers long and you're acquiring data very very rapidly um, you've got the vessel on location you've paid for its mo mobilization you're going to have to pay for its demo which is a fixed cost um, it's probably fair to say that around the edges of the, what uh, and you can see very raw data as you acquire it it's very raw but it's probably fair to say that woodside kind of um saw some features that they felt um you know it was worth basically go. I think particularly out to the east and the north, um, just worth ex extending out a few kilometres just to get a bit, a bit more, a bit more coverage. Probably shouldn't go into any more detail than that. Thanks, Ian. Now, on a similar theme to a previous question, uh, obviously the company has stated the quality of the three D seismic data is good. Is it possible? And I understand there might be some. Um, I guess some sensitivities around this, but is it possible to state whether the indications so far of the 3D data suggest that there is more or equivalent oil to what the 2D seismic data indicated uh, with associated probabilities, of course? Uh, again, yeah, that's we're, 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 not, we're too immature a stage really to start making that kind of commentary, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's okay, Ian. And look, one one more question to finish. Um, is there any update on the potential size of the resource? Again, uh, all on the same theme. Uh, I understand people want these numbers, uh, as, as do we, but yeah, we're just not in a position to be able to put anything out at this stage. No, I understand, Ian. Well, look, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, thank you all for joining myself Ian and, uh, and Ernie, and I'd also like to thank Ernie and Ian for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions. Um, as I mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on Pan Continental's website and social media platforms later today. Um, Ian, before I let you go, do you have any final comments to leave with us today? Oh, just saying, you know, I've, I've been involved with the company just since May of this year. Um, I'm, I'm just really excited by what I see here. I think for, for, a, for a junior like Pancon to be sat, in a, in a basin like this, it, it, it's um, 
it's a world class base, and this is fantastic prospectivity. We're talking about you know, potentially huge scale prospects. Um, it's just a great project to be part of, and I think we're, we're fair to say we're all excited about what the next um, 12 to 18 months brings. Thanks, Ian. Now, Ernie, before we go, anything to add? No, I, all I can say is it's going to be a very exciting to 2024, and um, we're just so um, so excited about what we uh, we see in front of us. Fantastic. Well, that wraps it up for us here. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks for hosting, Alex. Yeah, thanks.